distillations, fractional distillation, and non-ideal solutions. In this webcast, we will discuss a new type of distillation, a fractional distillation. Fractional distillation will apply the same principles you used for a simple distillation, just in a slightly different context. We will also discuss in this webcast the distillation of non-ideal solutions. This here is a fractional distillation setup. The setup is very similar to the simple distillation you assembled in the previous experiment. We have a round bottom flask, which is where your reaction occurs. You have this condenser, which cools your vapor into a liquid, which allows you to collect it here at the end. In fact, the setup is identical to the simple distillation setup, except for the addition of this fractionating column. This fractionating column is a glass tube which has been packed with steel wool. We'll talk about why steel wool is used in a little bit. Like with the simple distillation, do not attach your round bottom to the column with a Keck clamp, otherwise it may melt. Remember to use your metal hose clips here to connect your hoses to your condenser. Something that is not shown here but you should do is insulate your fractionating column and your round bottom flask here. Over the course of this experiment, the vapor that is boiling off here will travel up this column in order to be collected here in the condenser. However, as your vapor travels up, it will cool down. If it cools down too much, it will condense in the column and then drip back down into the round bottom flask. To keep the vapor from cooling too quickly, you will coat the column and the round bottom flask in aluminum foil. Like with a simple distillation experiment, there will be points associated with your TA checking your apparatus before you begin distilling. So this is a fractional distillation setup. What exactly does this fractionating column do for us? A fractional distillation is essentially a series of simple distillations. Consider this phase diagram, which is identical to what you saw for simple distillations. In the webcast for that experiment, we showed how you can take a mixture that is 0.8 mole fraction of A and perform a simple distillation to collect a liquid that is more enriched in B. However, we also discussed how this liquid is not particularly pure in either A or B. What you could imagine doing is taking that collected liquid and performing another simple distillation. Collecting that liquid, performing another simple distillation, and repeating that process until you received pure liquid, in this case, pure B. You might also imagine that performing six, seven, eight, or even more simple distillations in a row would be quite time consuming. What a fractional distillation allows us to do is essentially perform multiple simple distillations simultaneously. And we do this using that distillation column, also known as a fractionating column, we saw on the previous slide. That distillation column is rated based on the number of what we call theoretical plates within that column. A theoretical plate corresponds to the effect of one simple distillation. What happens in the distillation column is the vapor you produce in the distillation will condense inside the column. It will then re-evaporate, travel further up the column, and then condense again until it finally reaches the top of the column. Essentially, a plate is one cycle in this process. The purpose of the steel wool is to provide surface area for that vapor to condense. So in that distillation column, our vapor evaporates, condenses on that steel wool, evaporates again, condenses again, and continues until at the end we have a pure liquid. This may seem like ancient technology, and it is, but it is also incredibly useful because it is incredibly scalable. The gasoline you put in your car is produced from a fractional distillation. Here on the left we have an oil refinery, and these large metal tubes are very large fractionating columns, where raw petroleum is placed into the bottom of these columns and is allowed to fractionally distill up to the top. The inside of these towers is very similar to what we call a bubble cap column, which we have here on the right, where our liquid mixture is here at the bottom, and we boil it until it begins to produce vapor. The vapor travels up the column and condenses on each of these plates. The reason we use the term theoretical plates is because we have physical plates for the vapor to condense on. So the vapor is formed, condenses, evaporates, condenses, and continues all the way up until it is collected at the top. 
Here is a visual demonstration of how the number of theoretical plates within a fractionating column affects the composition of the liquid collected during a distillation. Here we have two different fractionating columns. We have the same amount of compound in the mixtures in the bottom of each column, but what is not the same is the number of plates inside of each column. This column on the left has three plates, this column on the right has six plates. Let's start distilling this mixture on the left. We're going to boil our liquid to make some vapor, and then the vapor will condense on the first plate. It's going to heat up again, make vapor again, condense on the second plate, and then once more to condense on the final third plate. As you can see, our final liquid mixture is enriched in the yellow circles, but it's not pure. What if we used more plates? If we repeat this process using the column on the right, we shall evaporate and condense, evaporate and condense, and continue that process until eventually, at the top of our column, we have pure yellow circles. More plates in a distillation column means you have what we call an efficient distillation. To put this in technical terms, the column on the right is more efficient than the column on the left. The column on the right has enough plates to give us pure product. The column on the left does not. And just to tie this back to that phase diagram I was showing you before, remember that each cycle corresponds to a plate. Now, in your distillation column, you will not have physical plates. You will instead have steel wool. This is why we use theoretical plates. Theoretical plates are a measure of the amount of surface area present within your column upon which repeated condensation and vaporization cycles can occur. More theoretical plates means more simple distillations, which therefore leads to more pure distillate, as you saw on the previous slide. The efficiency of a distillation column is measured in terms of height equivalent theoretical plates, or HETPs for short. We use HETPs because it makes measuring easier. We assume that all plates are of equal height. What this means is that having a smaller HETP corresponds to a higher efficiency column. Hopefully that makes sense. By having a smaller height, we can pack in more plates across the same distance. And remember, an efficient column is a column that has enough theoretical plates to give us pure product. Now, there is a trade-off here. More theoretical plates gives better separation, but it comes at the cost of time. The more plates we have, the more condensation and vaporization cycles we go through, and each of those cycles takes some amount of time. Let's take what we know and apply it to these two situations. I have two fractionating columns here. I have on the left a Vigru column, where we have glass indentations providing surface area for vapor to condense on. On the right, you have the column that you'll be using in this experiment, packed with steel wool. Column on the left has an HETP of 10 centimeters, while the column on the right has an HETP of 1.5 centimeters. Now let's consider this first question. What column would we use if we wanted to separate a mixture of pentane and octane, where there is a greater than 60 degrees C difference in boiling points? So, did you pick the more efficient column on the right, or the less efficient column on the left? I would use the less efficient column on the left. This is a pretty large difference in boiling points. Therefore, it should be pretty easy to separate them. That means using a less efficient column is better, because it will give us pure compound without costing us much time. In contrast, let's consider the second question. What column would we use if we wanted to separate a mixture containing methanol and water? This is a much smaller difference in boiling point, 35 degrees Celsius. Well, that's pretty close, and so I would probably bite the bullet and use the more efficient column on the right. It will take more time, but it is also guaranteed to give me pure compound. That brings us to the end of our discussion on fractional distillation. Now we will discuss the distillation of non-ideal solutions. We will define what a non-ideal solution is, and then we will see how the phase diagram for a non-ideal solution differs from the phase diagram of an ideal solution. Fear not, the same principles you learn to interpret ideal solution phase diagrams will be the same principles you will use to interpret non-ideal solution phase diagrams. Up until this point, we have been discussing what we call ideal solutions. 
Ideal solutions follow Routes' law and give us phase diagrams that look like this, which you are hopefully comfortable with. Unfortunately, not all solutions are ideal solutions. Non-ideal solutions create what we call deviations from Routes law. These deviations result from different interactions between the various components. Consider this situation. Interactions between like molecules, in this case A interacting with A and B interacting with B, are stronger than interactions between unlike molecules, A interacting with B. The consequence of this is the vapor pressure of the mixture is higher than that of an ideal solution. To put this another way, A does not like mixing with B, so this mixture is easy to evaporate. You have a high vapor pressure. Because we have a higher vapor pressure than we would if the solution was ideal, we have what is called a positive deviation. The positive refers to the higher vapor pressure. The consequence of having a positive deviation is we have what is called a minimum boiling point azeotrope. Now consider this new type of phase diagram. The x-axis is still some mole fraction of a compound and the y-axis is still temperature. Now in this phase diagram, which deviates from Routes law, we have two regions, a region on the left and a region on the right that meet at this point here. This point is called the azeotrope. It is a minimum boiling point azeotrope because it is the lowest boiling point on this phase diagram. What exactly is an azeotrope? An azeotrope is a mixture of two or more liquids whose composition cannot be changed via distillation. In this case, we have a minimum boiling point azeotrope. What this means is that after a distillation, we collect an azeotrope and one pure compound. Let's talk about why that is. Consider a situation where we are starting at a mixture that is 0.2 mole fraction of ethanol. Now, while this phase diagram may look different than the other phase diagrams you have seen, how you interpret it is exactly the same. Let's say we want to perform a simple distillation. In this case, we go up to the liquid line and then we move over to the vapor line, the same way we've always done. And then once we hit the vapor line, we go back down to the x-axis to collect our distillate, which now is roughly 0.7 mole fraction of ethanol. Okay, that's not so bad. Again, this is exactly what we have done in previous phase diagrams for ideal solutions. Now let's say instead of performing a simple distillation, I wanted to perform a fractional distillation. That means I would keep going until eventually I cannot go any further. And that occurs at the azeotrope. Notice how if I take this azeotrope and boil it, there's nowhere to move. I'm at the lowest boiling point on this phase diagram. That means that I can no longer purify this mixture. The take home message from this first part is that for a positive deviation phase diagram, which produces a minimum boiling point azeotrope, the liquid you collect is an azeotrope. But what about the liquid you leave behind? Remember, in a distillation, you don't boil the entire liquid mixture. If you did, you would simply collect the same mixture back. If the vapor is becoming more enriched in ethanol, what about the composition of the liquid? That means the liquid must be less enriched in ethanol until eventually all the ethanol distills off, leaving us with pure water. So while the vapor we form becomes more and more enriched in ethanol, the liquid we leave behind becomes more and more enriched in water, until eventually we get pure water. What if we started on the other side of the azeotrope? If we distilled something over here, the vapor would become more enriched in water, until eventually we reach the azeotrope again. But the liquid must be more enriched in ethanol, because the water is being boiled away to form the azeotrope. Now, if we have a positive deviation from Routes law, you can imagine that we also have a negative deviation from Routes law. In this case, interactions between unlike molecules are stronger than the interactions between like molecules. In this mixture, A holds on to B stronger than A holds on to A or B holds on to B. The mixture really wants to stay a mixture. It doesn't want to boil away. That means our vapor pressure 
is lower than that of what it would be if it was an ideal solution. Notice how the negative adjective refers to the vapor pressure. This type of solution forms a phase diagram that looks like this, where now we have a maximum boiling point azeotrope. The boiling point of the azeotrope is higher than the boiling point of pure A or B. How do we read this type of diagram? Well, you read it the same way you've read anything else. This phase diagram is for a mixture of formic acid and water. And let's say we start at 0.4 mole fraction formic acid. And we begin to do a fractional distillation. We go up until we hit the liquid line. We go over until we hit the vapor line. And then we come back down. All right, but we're going to keep going, right? Because we're doing a fractional distillation. So that continues over and over and over until eventually our collected distillate is pure water. What about the liquid left behind? If our vapor becomes more and more enriched in water, that means the liquid left behind must be less enriched in water. So the liquid left behind eventually reaches this azeotropic mixture. This is the opposite result of the positive deviation phase diagram, which had a minimum boiling point azeotrope. The vapor we collected was an azeotrope, while the liquid left behind was a pure compound. In this case, with a negative deviation, the liquid we collect is a pure compound, whereas the liquid left behind is an azeotropic mixture. The pure liquid you collect depends on which side of the azeotrope you are on. That brings us to the end of this webcast. To recap, a fractional distillation performs a series of simple distillations for superior separation compared to a simple distillation, but comes at the cost of time. The efficiency or the quality of a fractionating column is measured in what we call theoretical plates. The more theoretical plates a column possesses, the better separation that column will provide. Non-ideal solutions differ from ideal solutions because non-ideal solutions can form azeotropes. As a result, the phase diagrams for non-ideal solutions will look different than the phase diagrams for ideal solutions. Fortunately for us, the phase diagram interpretation rules you learn for ideal solutions still apply for the interpretation of phase diagrams of non-ideal solutions. When distilling, the vapor is always enriched in the direction of the lowest boiling point on the phase diagram.